the accounting pipeline and accounting education are both hot topics that all of us know are really on the front burner, both now and going forward. And here today, I'm thrilled to be joined by, by an expert in both fields. This is the NJCPA Issues Block Podcast. Welcome back to the NJCPA Issues Watch podcast. I'm your host, Sean Stein-Smith, and really, in every episode I host, I always try to talk about technology and the applications and implications of all of these tools, be it blockchain, crypto, AI, RPA, analytics, all the rest, on all of us, both now and going forward. And I'm also honored to be on the NJCPA Board of Trustees, and I really am always happy to, one, talk about these issues myself and to also bring in thought leaders and, and experts from the NGCPA and folks outside of the NGCPA also. And so, and so with all that said, I am thrilled to have on our so this month, my colleague and friend, Jack Kethengay, who is on the faculty out at Hofstra University out on Long Island, which I promise to not tease him too much about here <laughs> right now. And, and uh, on top of his role in academia, he's also a thought leader and VP at a leading accounting education company. So I'm really happy to have him here today to, to lend his expertise, right, both on a industry side, uh, academic side, and then also the business of education. Jack, happy to have you here today. Sean, I'm very, I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so hopping, hopping right into our, our main topic here today. In your role, both as an as a academic and a person who's relatively high up in the education business field, right? Are there any top issues out there, either good or bad right now in accounting education? I think some of the biggest issues we're seeing are around the collegiate accounting curriculum. Um, you know, as, as you know, you all just started your business school, right? So you have the accounting yeah. curriculum that maps perfectly there. I think what we're seeing is a lot of the curriculum we have today was designed 20 and in some instances 30 years ago, right? It's cost accounting one, financial accounting one, intermediate one, intermediate two, advanced. It's all heavy on more of the bookkeeping aspect of the business, right? More of the debits mm -hmm. and credits and the technical knowledge. Now, that's table stakes. So we definitely need that. But as, as more and more is done by technology, as RPA is being implemented on audits, as we're putting more data analytics from whether you're in cost accounting, whether you're in a financial reporting role, or whether you are out there on an audit, a lot of the curriculum hasn't moved to incorporate that technology yet. So we have that curriculum from 20 years ago, but we're using tools now that didn't exist 20 years ago. Um, no, I will say on the positive front, there's a lot of programs. Um, I'm going to tell our horn at Hofstra, we completely overdid our overhauled our entire curriculum, got it through state approval and have that in. There's a bunch of other programs that are doing that. But still right now, I think there's still too many programs that are in that old model. And what we're hearing from the firms, both at the higher education level um, and in the accounting CPE level, is the incoming staff don't have the tools and training that the firms want them to have. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's just because there's that disconnect again from what they're learning in school and what they're doing on the job now. And so how do we go about trying to close that gap, right? right, right because as somebody and uh, also you who were in industry for a while and then transitioned into higher education, it is totally different, right? The, yep. the, the, the pace of change in academia um, can be quite slow as compared to industry, as you just outlined. So are there any ways or any ideas or any tactics that, that you've seen that can help institutions try to play catch up? Sure. Um, I think one of the ways that we try to talk to some of our staff is just, just to tell them, if you're teaching a class, it's okay if you don't know the technology. You can incorporate the technology, whether again, whether it's RPA, analytics, Tableau, whatever software you're trying to put in, even if you're not an expert. I think right now, so many faculty are afraid to sit, go, go into it because they're not experts in it, right? They're experts in financial accounting, they're experts in mm -hmm. audit or tax, and they don't have that digital acumen side because you know when they were in practice, as you just said, or when they were going through their PhD programs or DBAs or whatever they have, 
it just wasn't a thing at the time. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense. But right now with the plethora of information and support tools that are out there, <clears throat> students can learn it on their own, right? Yeah. If you log into, um, I'm, I'm not pitching any software, it's just one I'm more familiar with because I use it in my classes. Sure. If you log into Tableau, they have thousands of videos. Like there, anything you want to do, if you're a student, you can just search for it and find out how to do it. And I think faculty need to just be a little bit more forward and willing to put in these technologies and just admit up front, like I'm not an expert on it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, cause I think students respond well to that and it's a way for them to get exposure. And also, I think it kind of maps to if you look at one of the things firms routinely say they want, right? And this is almost any job. I don't, I, I don't care if you're in accounting, if you're in marketing, management, finance, anything, is they want more critical thinking skills, right? They want students who can think outside the box. Well, if you give them a new tool, whatever that technology is, and say, you kind of need to figure it out. Here's what I want you to do with it, but you need to go on the journey on your own. That's about as much critical thinking as you can put <laughs> into something, right? Um, yeah. So I think I think by doing that, by putting in these newer technologies, even if it's on a small scale, just getting students introduced, used to working with it, used to thinking in that mindset, that'll help carry them through no matter what technology their firms use or whatever they want to use if they go out on their own. So I definitely think that we just need to be a little more willing and a little more kind of taking that risk of putting something in our classes that we're not fully experts on because we're used to being experts on the topics we teach. But it's okay now in this new environment, as technology changes so quickly, as tools change so quickly, it's okay to not be that expert. Mm -hmm. No, and uh, adding on to that, Jack, right? That's how it is in the, the, in the workplace, right? Every day is different. Every client is different. Every engagement is different. And so having that sort of not open to mind, but sort of that ability to analyze a issue, to analyze the, the tools that you have, and to figure out how they overlap, that's really a key part of the uh, everyday work. Very much so. Going forward, yep. Yeah, I had a, um, a partner of one of the large public accounting firms in New York who came to me and said, I just want our staff to constantly look out and ask, how can I do that better? And mm -hmm. I think if you start that mindset in the undergrad level or at the grad level, if they're coming from a different major, right? Just constantly thinking, how can I do something better or easier? I think that'll completely change how they approach work and it'll allow them to open up these new tools that we need them to have in the education space. Well said. Now, any, any conversation that's around accounting education and the pipeline, we have to talk about this huge issue in the room, right? That, and, and I know that there are strong, uh, strong views on every angle of this conversation. But Jack, what do you think about the 150 credit rule? Because I know, and I encourage anybody and everybody to follow Jack on social media because he posts some great stuff <laughs> out there. So I, so I, I kind of have, I kind of uh, have an idea. But, but sort of, <laughs> what are some of your thoughts on how this conversation could evolve going forward? Uh, as you know, I have some nuanced views on the 150 hours. Um, but I try to look at it from if we were creating this CPA license today would we have it look like what we have it now, right? We have the 150 hours and the 2000 hour requirement in most states to be licensed. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we would, right? I think, I think we would go back to some type of hybrid model to where, okay, maybe we're gonna require them to have an undergrad one, and that's 120 hours in most programs, and then 30 more credits, but keep that 2000 hour limit that we have. So that's the current model. But do we really need that model? You know, If I've been working in accounting for 10 years, do I really need to go back and get an extra 30 credits? What, like, what else is that 30 credits gonna bring to the table that I haven't had from 10 years of experience or five years of experience? So I think we could change that model to 120 hours and then some type of work experience, whether it's two years, three years, four years, whatever that is, change that 2000 hour limit to where you can replace education with work experience. Cause that's mm -hmm. the ultimate education, right? As you're saying on the job in practice is the best education you can get in accounting. Why would we discount that just because the person doesn't have an extra 30 credits that even need not be in accounting, right? I can get my extra 30 credits in English or history, right? So something that doesn't align with what I'm going to be doing. Um, I think another model that I've kind of toyed with talking to a couple of friends about on the side is taking the 120 hours you have to have and then 30 CPE credits then, right? Because in, in most states, you don't have to start getting CPE until after your two years post um, licensure. All right, so you, you get a two-year kind of uh, down window to where you don't need CPE. 
Well, if we want people to be educated on the most recent accounting topics, why don't we just put that CPE requirement in year one? That's how it is in Canada. So, you know, as soon as you get licensed, you have to start earning CPE based on when you got licensed. Um, and I think that's a way to kind of take that 150 hour rule down because what we're, what we're not considering in the profession is those extra 30 credits right now are often for a lot of students at, at the grad level. Right? The average graduate tuition, I, I wanna say in like New York State is around $26,000. So students are foregoing a year of salary they're actually having to take on more debt for an extra 30 credits that they could get through some other level. So we're putting students at a financial disadvantage by having that 30 extra credits there relative to almost any other profession, right? You, you don't need 30 extra credits in marketing. You don't need 30 extra credits in finance to get your series exam. So I think there's, a, there's so many approaches that we can improve and we don't have to just pick one, right? Again, we can look at it from, if we're designing this today, what would we do differently? And I really think the 150 hours as it current stands, I think it needs to go. Um, I, think, I, think, I think candidates need options. I think it's hurting the pipeline. I think students are looking at that fifth year and saying, if I'm starting at the same salary, you know, average auditor, I think by the Robert Half study is about 55,000 or median, sorry, not average. If I'm starting at that, the median undergraduate from any program averages about 54 to 55,000. So really, we need to make the value proposition of accounting and the 150 hours is hurting us in making that value proposition argument. Uh, and well said. And and I do know that that I've had that I've had conversations on this topic with a whole host of people, both in higher education and in and in industry. And and you know, there are strong views on both sides, right? Right. There are people who feel that having that that 150 credit hour, having that master's level uh basically a re requirement does make CPAs a head above other other folks out there who are doing only only bookkeeping services. Yep. But 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 I but I do really want to highlight um that basically there is this need, right? That that if that if all of us are are out there as as we try to do to be a trusted advisor, be a be a business partner to really help our clients be the individuals or institutions better evolve at the at the business planning level, then it is at the very least, I think, worth uh, examining ourselves in terms of how we try to have our students have the future uh, uh, leaders of our field to get out. And, exactly. and, and I do also want to plug, plug that there was a pilot program underway at uh, uh, St. Peter's that actually is doing some of this stuff right now trying to combine the undergrad and some on the job work sort of hands on. Uh, and I believe it's a internship program. So, it is. so there is a lot going on out there. It's going to be very interesting, I think, to see how it does uh, evolve going forward. Though. Very much so. No, and and I, I think those out of the box programs, I, I want to say St. Peter's is partnered with PwC there, right? To get the 30 mm -hmm. um, credits yes. through the internship program. I mean, I think that's the type of thinking we need in the 150 hour space to kind of meet students where they are and help take that financial burden off of them. And so to, to add on, right, to, to a few of your comments from earlier, you know, are, are there any, and, and there obviously are a whole bunch of, of topics and uh, issues out there, um, are there two or three really, really hot areas, be it tech related, be it uh, ESG, be it the idea of a continuous audit and sort of how that changes basically everything else. Are there any two or three areas that to echo on your point from earlier that that people in education, be they at a college or other institution of higher learning or even in a CPE, a CPE course, um, could highlight and introduce to just raise the profile of those issues and to help both current students and folks out there currently working have a better handle on how the field is evolving. Sure. Um, I think one of the baseline ones, even before you get to how the field's evolved, is still just basic or intermediate Excel level, right? I think I think that still needs to be emphasized on all the programs, because even if you look at, you know, if you look at Power BI, if you look at a lot of these data analytics tools, um, a lot of their inputs are Excel files, right? Like a lot of what you're doing is you're merging Excel files together, and most of your clients are still working in Excel. Um, so I think baseline is just, yeah, start off with those 
Excel skills that we've talked about for 10 years, you know, because I'm guessing we're probably going to be talking about them for at least another five. Anytime we get a new technology, they, they all interface with Excel. And there's a reason for that. Um, but to your point, ESG is not going away, right? It's had various names in the past. Uh, you know, I think when you and I were going through school, it was CSR. Then it just became sustainability. Now it's ESG. Um, and that's not going anywhere. It's only going to get more prevalent. Um, as you know, the SEC is looking at rules into um, disclosure requirements uh, around it. Parts of the EU are now going to require audits on just the ESG side. And that's a whole untapped market for accounting professionals, right? Because we historically have not been in the space of looking at conflict minerals or climate disclosures, um, anything like that. And I think a lot of our curriculum, unless you have that science engineering interest when you're in school, doesn't really mention it either. So I think by putting that in, even if you said, I think it's great at a high level, right? You don't have to be mm -hmm. an expert. You know, just pull some Harvard Business Review articles. You can go in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal and find articles on it. Um, Bloomberg has done a good job covering it, mm -hmm. right? And just putting those into your class and saying, hey, when you get out here, this is how you need to look at it. And this is what you need to know because your clients are going to ask you about it, All right? You don't have to be an expert, but when your client comes to you and says, hey, um, we have a factory in this other country that we really don't have a lot of oversight over. What do I need to do? You need to know how to be able to answer that question or at least where to point them. Um, and you know, that is such a new that, that's such a new topic in our space. But I think it's exciting because it's different. A lot of the students and the candidates we have care about it greatly. Um, I think the more you put that in, I think the better off we're going to be. One of the other ways is still, I think, you know, as you look, you're at, you're like one of the foremost experts in the accounting crypto space, right? And whatever comes out of that, FTX being what it is. Kind right? of stressful but, right now, let me tell you. Highly kind of stressful, stressful, right? <laughs> but that also, you know, when when I look at FTX, that shows the importance of accounting, right? You know, they were commingling funds. Some of the funds didn't exist. And if you think about even some of those traditional audit procedures that we could have done 20 years ago, 30 years ago, those would have helped here, right? And I think it shows how they're even more important than they were recently, right? Um, you know, when we teach audit students, we, we tell them we're normally more worried about fraud than errors, right? Now, we don't know all the facts behind this, but anytime we have one of these, it just heightens the need for more accounting, more auditing space, right? More focus on some of the, the fundamentals, but then showing them how they apply to these contemporary topics, right? You know, because we can all use this old manufacturing example to teach it. But why not just go straight to the source and cover the new crypto space, right? Show them, hey, yes, counting cash is easy, right? You can just look at a bank statement. Now, how do I account for this currency that's currently trading on five different exchanges at five different prices, right? And that's interesting because, again, that combines those critical thinking skills, that combines some of the technology because you have to understand how it's priced, right, where it's traded. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's an exciting space. And again, as an accounting educator, you need not be an expert. Just introduce it, go over the basics and show them just so again, when when a client comes to you, you know, I think the first one was micro strategies, right? Like a, a few years ago and put it on their balance sheet. You have to have an answer for your client, right? Like, hey, we just got paid in this or we're, we are considering putting some of our you know, money market funds into there. And you know, I think that's a way to get students excited, but it's also a way as, as faculty, as educators, to show students that we're staying up to date, right? Like we are putting those topics that they see in the news, that they care about, that their friends are talking about. And it's a way to stay up to date, but also show them why what we're doing is so relevant and so important in today's space. Well said, well said. The, right, right, because if we're having this conversation and there is some broader conversation in higher education, which I won't bore you all with here, but there is this, <laughs> but there's this bigger problem on the higher ed pipeline and and all of that. So really, you know, in in any context, either in the classroom for in-house training or for ongoing CPEs, bringing in headlines and and trying to connect those dots between the underlying sort of fundamentals, right? Blocking, tackling, basically, and then how all of that does directly connect to issues like FTX, which I have a whole other host of uh, thoughts on myself, but uh, but they're but sort of bridging that gap can go a long way to addressing not not totally nor all of them but a but a lot of the questions and doubts um yeah. that are currently out there, right in the accounting pipeline accounting education space 
Very much and so. so and so and so to sort of wrap up here, Jack, you know, are there any resources that you and your colleagues and your team uh, use use to say up to date on your end? Sure. Um, you know, I, I would say on the on the CPA licensure side, right? Luckily, the ASDPA gives us a blueprint of what they expect candidates to know. Um, and and for the evolution, they actually put out for the first time, at least in recent memory, a model curriculum. So if you're in the education space, right, like what what should you have in your accounting, um, whether it's a certificate program or degree program. Um, but more recently for us, you know, luckily accounting today does a great job of updating anytime there's changes. Um, the FASB has their pronouncements, the SEC and the PCOB, luckily because they are government agencies, um, they have to go through the regulatory process, right? They have to issue comment periods, et cetera. So we stay pretty much on top of that um, at a pretty high rate. On the tax side, right? You're just following legislation like anyone else is. Um, tax notes is super helpful for that. But really, it's just saying, um, I think I, I think what we need to do a little more often is just go to our clients, go to our firms and say, what are you seeing, right? What are you seeing on the job that's different from what you saw last year? Um, what are your clients telling you that they're dealing with that may be an issue, maybe not this quarter, next quarter, or even this year, but a year or two down the road so that we can prep and have our, you know, have, have our clients, have our firms, have our candidates ready for that when it happens, right? Because um, you know, I think as we are accountants, we've always thought things from as a backward looking standpoint, right? Okay, what were the numbers last year, right? What, what were earnings? But I think we need to, as we move forward, as there's going to be more changes as technology and new financial tools are coming out, I think we need to more to be more forward looking. And say, what is the landscape going to look like in two years, three years, five years, and what do we need to do to prepare for that? Um, you know, I don't think we do enough stress testing in uh, in accounting to say we we've had these assumptions, right? We assume interest rates are going to be two to three percent for our lifetimes. But what happens when they're not? Right. And, and I think I think we need to start asking more of those forward looking questions as a way to both improve the education space, but also allow us to prep and be ready for when these things do happen. So where we're not caught back on our heels, you know, blocking and tackling. Right. No one wants to be caught back on your heels. Um, and I think the more we do that, the more we stay ahead of these changes and the more we're in constant communication with our clients, with the firms. I think that's what we have to do on a day to day basis. Excellent points, Jack. And, you know, it, it, it honestly has been great having you on the podcast, right? And, and I do encourage anybody and everybody who is, who is encouraged in, in topics like this at all, please follow Jack on social media. He's on uh, LinkedIn and on Twitter at the very least. So, <laughs> so, I, so I do encourage you all to follow him. He's a real wealth of knowledge and expertise in this space. Jack, it was a pleasure having you on. John, the uh, pleasure is mine. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And just to wrap up our podcast episode for here today, just, just a few quick notes for all of you. I do highly, highly recommend all of you to, to go and sign up for the NJCPA Emerging Technologies Interest Group by going to njcpa.org forward slash groups. And all of our episodes of all of the NJCPA issues watch podcast are online at njcpa.org forward slash podcast. Thanks. Have an awesome day.